Chapter 28. Albert Schweitzer. In the early years of the 20th century, it was widely held that the greatest Christian of the century was Albert Schweitzer, born 1875 to 1965. As a result, very early in the 1930s, I began to read his works on the Gospels, on Bach, and in particular his The Decay and Restoration of Civilization, 1932, Civilization and Ethics, 1919, and Indian Thought and Its Development, 1936. What was very clear from these works was that Schweitzer, while an ordained pastor, made no pretense in his writings of being a Christian. His was a philosophy of the reverence for life, all life, so that it was a part of his ethics to rescue worms stranded on walkways after a rainstorm. Killing bacteria harmful to man was a problem to him because it meant killing life, which was universally to be reverenced. Schweitzer's thinking was hardly even post-Christian. It was Enlightenment logic carried to its reasonable conclusion. In The Decay and Restoration of Civilization, he saw rationalism as the spiritual maturity of man. Quote, All real progress in the world is, in the last analysis, produced by rationalism. End quote. For him, quote, The ethical mysticism of reverence for life is rationalism, thought to a conclusion. End quote. In Civilization and Ethics, Schweitzer held, quote, In the matter of our relation to other men, the ethic of reverence for life throws upon us a responsibility so unlimited as to be terrifying. Here again it offers no rules about the extent of the self-maintenance which is allowable. Again, it bids us in each case to come to terms with the absolute ethic of self-devotion. I have to decide in accordance with the responsibility of which I am conscious how much of my life, my possessions, my rights, my happiness, my time and my rest I must devote to others and how much of them I may keep for myself. A man is truly ethical only when he obeys the compulsion to help all life which he is able to assist and shrinks from injuring anything that lives. He does not ask how far this or that life deserves one's interest as being valuable, nor beyond that, whether and how far it can appreciate such interest. Life as such is sacred to him. He tears no leaf from a tree, plucks no flower and takes care to crush no insect. If in summer he is walking by lamplight, he prefers to keep the window shut and breathe a stuffy atmosphere rather than see one insect after another fall with singed wings upon his table. If he goes into the street after a shower and sees an earthworm which is straight onto it, he bethinks himself that it must get dried up in the sun. If it does not get back soon enough to ground into which it can burrow, and so he lifts it from the deadly stone surface and puts it on a puddle, he stops a moment in order to hold out a leaf or a stalk on which it can save itself. End quote. For Schweitzer, ethics is respecting the will to live of all living things as much as his own. Good morality is respecting the will to live of all other living creatures. Bad morality is destroying life. For Schweitzer, quote, Whatever is reasonable is good. To be truly rational is to become good. End quote. But what is rational? It would appear that for Schweitzer it is the abandonment of Orthodox Christianity for Renaissance and Enlightenment rationalism. He spoke favourably of both the Renaissance and the 18th century Illuminati. The question must thus be raised, wherein does Schweitzer differ from the Marquis de Sade? Sad began with the equality of all acts other than those motivated by biblical supernatural morality. For him, Christianity was the only evil and a moral form of life because it was anti-natural. Schweitzer's reverence for life does not call for sad study in moralism, but it rests on the same uncritical reverence for all of life and implicitly all kinds of activity. Now, Schweitzer would no doubt have disagreed with Sad. But having no doctrine of sin other than a lack of reverence for life, Schweitzer had no valid ground for a critique of sad, for whom it was a pleasure in being hurt. This for them was life. Schweitzer did not use the word sin, but for him, no doubt, 
meant a lack of reverence for life. For Sad, the reverence for life meant reverence for unfettered and free sexual expression. Schweitzer's works are mainly badly dated. In particular, his biblical studies are very much irrelevant and have received no scholarly attention for many years and were of only brief concern in their day. On the other hand, his Indian Thought and its Development, 1936, a much-neglected work, is still relevant. Schweitzer found Far Eastern philosophies, most notably those of India, marked by a negation of life in their worldviews. Since basic to Schweitzer's philosophy and faith is the affirmation of and reverence for life, his analysis was a telling one. Because Eastern religious thought is marked by a negation of life, there is a lack of positive ethical action. Thus, the Bhagavad Gita is marked by renunciation of the complete maintenance of the difference between good and evil. Indian thought has no consistent ethics of action, only an ethics of withdrawal, which is a denial of the efficacy of ethics. For Schweitzer, whose ethics is one of action, that is, the affirmation of life, Eastern thought is a dangerous surrender. But Schweitzer's problem is that his ethics has no real substance to it. Eastern thought negates life and seeks to escape from it. Sad hated life and treated it with content. Schweitzer called for the reverence for life, but he had only his personal preference for this, no moral imperative. Moreover, since we live by eating, our reverence for life becomes a pragmatic matter. We do not ask the permission of plants and animals before eating them. Schweitzer's ethics of reverence for life leaves all men guilt-ridden if they practice it. This is hardly a good, life-affirming view. Schweitzer's religion is not unlike that of Allen Ginsberg, for whom everything that lives was holy. In Out of My Life and Thoughts, 1948, Schweitzer said that, quote, The great fault of all ethics hitherto, end quote, has been its limitation of ethics to the relation of man to man. Since biblical law has laws dealing with the treatment of animals, plants and waste materials, this is certainly not true. But the Bible lays down laws from God to man that govern God's property, that is, man and all creation. It is God who is holy and therefore must be obeyed. For Schweitzer, it is life that is holy, a very different perspective. Schweitzer's ties thus are close to the environmentalists, the Gaia worshippers, the devotees of the exaltation of Mother Earth and nature above God and man. The whole focus of life is shifted. Thus he wrote, quote, I never go to a menagerie because I cannot endure the sight of the misery of the captive animals. The exhibiting of trained animals I abhor. What an amount of suffering and cruel punishment the poor creatures have to endure in order to give a few moments pleasure to men devoid of all thought and feeling for them. End quote. Schweitzer here sounds like opponents of the sale of furs, enemies of trained animal acts and other of our present-day animal activists. For Schweitzer, everything that lives is sacred. He thus had no valid grounds with coping with the murder of men by men. To live for him was to incur guilt, and he could speak of, quote, his tortured soul, end quote. Despondency, estrangement and pessimism marked his life. He acknowledged his great debt to the Stoics. Schweitzer's world was that of Charles Darwin, quote, A portrait of Charles Darwin hung in the wall of his room rather than a likeness of Kant, Goethe, Zwingli or Luther, end quote. Quote, He was in fact a thorough humanist, end quote. Schweitzer became a medical missionary to blacks in Africa. Since his death, he has fallen out of favour with many because of his supposed racism. In reality, what he manifested was a scholar's sense of superiority towards the uneducated. In actuality, he admired the African sense of resignation to life. For Schweitzer, reverence for life was the basis of ethics. After that, most important was resignation which he found common to, quote, primitive cultures, end quote. He held that, quote, resignation is the very basis of ethics, end quote. This placed him close to Hindu thought. In fact, 
He went beyond many Hindus. Quote, I never burn a field. Think of all the insects that perish in such a fire. End quote. Perpetual guilt was basic to Schweitzer's view. W.F. Albright, in a review, saw Schweitzer's work as second rate. His biblical studies and his writings on Bach are not highly rated, nor his abilities as an organist. His pantheistic religion did not qualify him as an important thinker. A, quote, pantheistic humanism, end quote, Albright called it. His ethics, quote, is definitely in the Brahmin Buddhist and not in the Christian tradition, end quote. His is an, quote, ethical panvitalism of a rather naive type, end quote. From the standpoint of medical science, Schweitzer's African medical mission ranked low. He also had an, quote, aloofness from human suffering, end quote. For Albright, Schweitzer's philosophy of civilization, quote, belongs definitely to the literature of philosophical escapism, end quote. Albright's opinion is a fair one. Unhappily, men are not always influenced by the best thinking. <laughs>